yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fled. All with the church of times, no music is obviously where hyper comes from. Uh, and then they sell this at the at the the CS department there. Um, so I got one. All right, so let's, let's jump into this. Uh, hopefully every, everybody had a good break. Uh, so quickly on the, on the docket for everyone, if you haven't signed up for a, a system in, for Project 2, please do that. There was a couple, um, I added some new suggestions. There was another crazy database that I've added from somebody else, uh, if you want to write about that one. Um, and if you haven't approved yet, please poke me in and we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. And then for Project 3, the next thing coming up for you is the status update on, on, uh, for April 3rd. Uh, there's some people, some, some groups I still need to follow up on about additional feedback. And then the final presentation, we, only got, we have, finally have a date and time for the, the final exam will be on May 5th at 5.30 p.m. I guess we can just do it in here, I think. Um, and then we'll, we'll get pizza, okay? All right, any questions about project two or project three? And then when is in Brunei for the next month or so, uh, I think dealing with visa issues and, and the <laughs> there. So, uh, so let's get back into the world of databases. So today we're going to talk about uh, sort merge joins. Um, and the, the main spoiler is going to be that this is always going to be, or almost always going to be, inferior to hash joins. Um, and some systems won't actually implement sort merge joins. The enterprise systems will, will, will implement this because they want to implement both. Because there's some cases where you want the output to be sorted on the key that you're joining on. So therefore, a sort merge join would, would actually be better because you can kill, kill two birds with one stone. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll go through what it looks like. Uh, and how to, how to speed it up. And again, it applies some of the techniques that we've talked about before of, of how to use SIMD, how to run on, um, on multiple cores, how to be aware of, of the NUMA regions to get, to get the best performance. And the reason why I'm still including this, because when we start talking about worst case optimal joins or the multi, multi-way joins on Wednesday, they're basically going to be doing like a sort merge join, but with, with more than two tables at a time. Okay. All right, so the, uh, for the sort merge join, again, the high-level idea is that we have two tables we want to join, R and S, and we're first going to sort them on the keys that they want to join. Then once that's done, we would then have this merge phase where there'll be two iterators pointing at each, each of the two tables, and the idea is that we're going to walk through in lockstep and compare against the, wh whatever the two, the, the two iterators are pointing at. And the idea is that because we've sorted things ahead of time, that the iterator, at least on the outer relation, will never have to backtrack, you know, if we're doing an equi join without duplicates, we'll never have to backtrack because we know that the thing that we're looking for cannot be ab above where the iterator is actually pointing at. Right? If you're doing a, a naive uh, nested loop join, you're doing sequential scan because you're looking for like a needle in the haystack every single time for every single tuple in the outer relation. You're doing clean scan on the, on the inner relation. But with the sort merge join, because we pay this upfront cost of sorting the data, then we don't have to worry about that. We know that we, we, the thing that we're looking for can't be some part of the, the table that, that we've already uh, scanned, right? So for this, for this you know, in the very beginning, I'm not going to define what the, sort, the sorting algorithm is going to be. That's the main thing we're going to focus on. Well, that's, we'll start with that, we'll focusing on that. Uh, in general, I would say the, the modern variations of quick sort are going to be the vectorized ones are going to be what you're going to want to use. For really large relations, for smaller ones, we can use the Batonic merge sort or Batonic sorting networks, what I'll talk about in a second. All right. All right. So visually, it just looks like this. We have two relations. We're going to sort them. I'm not defining what the, sort, the sorting uh, algorithm is just yet. Then we do a merge in the second phase. Again, we have this iterator, or just rips through, and it's comparing against a tuple from the outer table or and a tuple with the inner table. All right. So what's going to be confusing today is that we're going to be talking about the sort merge join algorithm, but then the sorting algorithm we're going to, we're going to focus on is a merge sort alg sorting algorithm. So I'll just try to be careful when I talk about the use term merge, whether I'm talking about the merge phase of the, uh, the merge sort or the sort mer merge, okay? Which can be, can be confusing. And again, the, there are vectorized variants of, of, of uh, quick sort that, that we can use for this as well, right? So we talked about sort merge joins in the intro, intro database class in 445, 645, but we didn't spend time talking about workers or NUMA regions or vectorization. So what this lecture is really about is how to now consider these other design decisions to get the best performance on, on a modern CPU, on a modern architecture. 
So in a parallel sort versus join, the sorting is obviously going to be always the most expensive part. Right? And the way we're going to speed up sorting is through, through parallelization. So the idea is we want to execute this, the sorting across multiple, multiple, uh, multiple threads or multiple workers, and then have each of those workers try to use vectorized, ops, uh, vectorized instructions as much as possible. And then, the, then the, the, in the merge phase is then to figure out, OK, where are we going to put our output of our sorted data? And how are we going to do our comparisons? Is it going to be local within a, in a memory region or a NUMA region? Or are we going to allow them to go communicate to any possible core? And there'll be trade-offs for the number, you know, doing a bunch of reads and writes in the beginning or a bunch of reads later on. Right? There's no free lunch, and we'll, we'll see how uh, the different approach to, to do this. So the, the main rules are what, what we're going to try to do here is we want to use as many CPU cores as possible. Right? And now, in some database systems, they're only going to execute one query at a time. So in that case, you just get all the cores that are available. If the system is trying to multiplex uh, queries and have schedulers, then you have to decide you know, how many cores the query can use. Uh, but we, we can ignore that for now. And in a modern CPU architecture, we care about NUMA regions because, again, the remote memory access, if you're on a different on a cores on a different accessing memory region that's, that's local to another, another CPU socket, you're going to pay a 2x latency penalty for, for that. So ideally, you want to access the data that's, that's local to you. And ideally, only access data that's in your CPU cache. Or if you bring something to the CPU cache, do all the work you need to do on it before you move on to the next data item. And of course, we want to use vectorized SIMD instructions when possible. Right? So the, in the case of the hyper uh, approach, they're going to ignore this, the second one here, the, the Newman boundaries. Because they're going to make this claim that, oh, that all the threads that when you're doing the merge is, are going to be doing sequential reads. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether the data is local or not in your, in your local NUMA region, because the harbor prefetcher is going to hide all that for you. And <laughs> Abby's shaking her head no. Right, in, in the paper you guys read, it turns out to be not the case. I should have asked Thomas why, why, the, <laughs> why you believe this back in 2011. I would say in the new version of Umbra, or the, the new system they're building, they don't, even do any, they don't even do sort merge join. They only support hash joins. So just like in a, the, the parallel uh, hash join, in the parallel sort merge join, there's going to be three phases. The first phase is, is the partitioning phase, where you can split the data up uh, you know, using like the radix partition approach that we talked about before to divide the data up across different cores and different workers based on the, the join keys. And this is the same technique that we talked about in, in the hash join before, before the class, before, uh, before the spring break. So we're not gonna, we don't need to discuss this because we, we know how to do that. The, the idea is basically the same thing. Then in the next phase, again, we do our sort based on the join keys. And then, we, again, this is looking forward, we do, we do our merge compare tuples. And then depending on whether we're doing echo join or not, and depending on whether it's duplicates or not, uh, we would only need to scan the, 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 the outer table once. The inner table, you may have to, you have to backtrack. So you have to keep track of where you, where you left off, where, where the last unique value looked at, and jump back to it. OK? All right, so for the sort phase, in general, the quick sort is probably going to be what most systems are going to use. And in, in, in the intro class, when we talked about the sorting algorithms, we always said that the disk was, was the main bottleneck. And that the reason why we couldn't use quick sort is because we were concerned about spilling the disks when, when we do our pivots and split, splits. Um, and therefore, we chose to use an ex like the external merge sort algorithm because that maximized the amount of sequential reads and writes we were doing. But for this class, we're going to assume that our data set that we want to, we want to join is going to fit in memory. Right? And therefore, uh, quick sort it might be actually a good idea. And, and again, in most cases, it actually will be. So we're going to look at merge sort because, again, again, it'll have building blocks like the sorting networks that will be used as the fast, fast pass or fast um, as an optimized uh, shortcut, what's the word I'm looking for? Use case for quicksort. Like if you actually look at this, the, the, the source code of like the modern vectorized quicksort algorithms, they check to see if the number of keys is less than 128 or 256. And if so, then they're using the, the sorting networks that we'll use for the, the merge sort algorithm from, from Intel. All right? The downside of this, though, is going to require, uh, on average, an additional uh, storage for intermediate results because you have to s sort it and then, you know, Take the input in and then write it out as a, as a sorted, sorted array. So you, you need double the, double the space. So 
we'll talk about the merge sort algorithm first, because again, this, this will make it clear about the Newman regions and the parallel cores. And then we'll briefly talk about the, uh, uh, the, the quick sort, like the Google and the, and the Intel one, which j just came out last year. But there's another one, DJB sort, which I don't fully understand myself, but that claims to be the fastest one out of all of these. So the sorting algorithm we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about is gonna be a cache conscious approach. And that just means that the algorithm itself has to be aware of the, what the hardware it is that it's actually running on, the size of the, of the CPU caches, right? the size of the register, the number of registers it has to deal with. Right? A cache oblivious algorithm, algorithm tries to, is designed to ignore all this, whereas in our cache conscious sorting algorithm, we're gonna know how big is our L1, L2, L3, how big our registers are, and then based on the size of the data that we're trying to sort, because we're gonna sort of do a divide and conquer approach, that we're gonna switch the strategy as the, the sorted runs get larger and larger, All right? Nope. Okay, so this is the cache conscious sorting approach from Intel from 2009. Remember when I talked about the different, the history of like the sort merge join versus hash join algorithms like I talked about how there was this paper in 2009 from Intel and, and Oracle that said, hey, we have a uh, hash join is currently faster, faster, but if you had a 500, AV, 512-bit Zimby registers, you could do sort merge and that could be faster. So that's what this approach I'm describing here is what they proposed back in the day and only now with, with AVX 512 can we actually implement this. So you, the idea here is, again, we're going to break up our, our, our total data set we want to, we want to sort into smaller dis, disjoint chunks called runs, and we're going to sort those runs, uh, and, and then we're going to then merge the sorted runs of the same size into larger sort, uh, sorted runs. And the idea we progressively get bigger and bigger uh, with these sorted runs until we end up with the entire, the entire table uh, uh, sorted. All right? And again, the idea is that we're gonna have these different levels, we're gonna use these different approaches based on the size of the run that we're sorting. So in level one, we can have things fit in our CPU registers. Uh, could be SIMD, could be the CPU itself, uh, or the, the SISD registers. And we're gonna to try to do, or we will do sorting based on that. Then as it gets a little bit larger, and we exceed our registers, we'll switch to level two, we'll do in-cache sorting, where everything fits into the CPU cache. Um, and then once we exceed that, the last level cache, then we'll switch to the out-of-cache sorting. Right, and then the, the challenge is going to be that we always going to need in it for each level because we're doing uh, we're not doing in place updates to our, our our data as we sort it. We're always going to need double the amount of space in each level for our input data. Right, so in level two, you need to have you can only sort a, uh, imp, uh, a run that is half the size of your CPU cache because you need a, you need to use the other half to write the output in. Right. So we're not going to worry exactly about the, the difference between L1 and L2 and L3, right? As long as it fits in our last level cache, the L3 cache, then the, and not spill to DRAM, then we can, you can choose to do this one or the, or the, the first one, right? So like basically, I think a modern CPU is now like Intel, uh, the 2022 Sapphire Rapids, that's like I think 90 meg megabytes of L3 cache. Then AMD, the Ryzen 9 is like 128 megabytes. Um, so it's big, but not like, you know, if, you're, if your table is, is gigabytes, then this won't work, right? Or sorry, you, you, you can't do everything in, 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 in level two. I'll say also that I'm calling this level one, level two, level three. This is my term in the original paper. I think they call it phase one, phase two, phase three. But if we're talking about sort merge join, which has the sort phase and, and the merge phase, then there's too many phases and I, I just called it level, right? Okay, so again, Pictographically, it just looks like this. So we have our unsorted input data, either from the, uh, the outer relation or the inner relation. And then in level one, we're gonna break this up into uh, four element uh, runs. We're gonna sort that. Then we go to, to uh, level two, we'll now have uh, sorted runs that are, that are half the size of the CPU cache. And then when this exceeds our CPU cache, then we go down and do uh, to, to level three and we keep doing you know keep combining things together until we end up with our entire data set sorted right so again that high level just get divide and conquer and we're going to merge things back together 
So level one is uh, going to use what's a technique called sorting networks. Uh, so this is an old idea that goes back to the 1940s. Um, but like back then, it was described in, in terms of like hardware. So they're going to refer to things as, as like wires. Like you, you, you're going to compare the values on wires and write it out to a wire. They literally meant back in the day, like writing the actual value on a like copper wire, because it was, it was the 1940s. But now, obviously, everything's transistors. And we're, we're going to do this in, uh, in, in software, right? So the idea is that you have these, these four inputs coming in. And then you have these comparator steps where you're going to do, uh, compute the min and max for the values that are coming on these two wires. And the min will get written out to the top wire, and the max will get written out to the bottom wire. Right? So in the first step here, these values get passed forward. So here we're going to do a comparison between uh, 9 and 5. 5 is smaller than 9, so it gets written out to the top wire. 9 is larger than 5, so it gets written out to the bottom wire. Right, and then same thing, same thing down here. Three and six gets written out, and then this gets passed over. Now you take the output of this wire from this comparator, which is five. Take the output of this wire from this comparator, which is three, and you compare five and three. Three gets written to the top, which goes fed out to the output array, and then five gets passed over uh, to the next one. Right, and you keep going on like this, and then you end up with you finally your sorted array, right? So in our example, we're using four elements because we're doing, we can assume we're going to do 128-bit SIMD registers, which you can do four elements in, in an AVX 512, right? Because you're going to need, assuming 64 bits for the key and then 64 bits for the tuple ID. Um, again, this is why, again, the, the original paper from 2009 said, hey, if we have AVX 512, we can do this. Because if you need 64-bit keys and 64-bit IDs, you need 128-bit lanes. In the Columbia paper, where we talked about the different approaches to do SIMD algorithms, they only had AVX2, which is 256 bits, uh, SIMD registers, but they were, they were assuming you had a 32-bit key and a 32-bit tuple ID. Right? But again, in a real system, that's, that's not the case. And you might have 32-bit you know, uh, IDs, or sorry, 32-bit uh, join key to compare against, but most systems would use 64-bit pointers just to keep track of tuple IDs. Right? So this is kind of neat. Uh, why, is, why would this be fast? What's the sort of obvious about this? Think of like quick sort. Quick sort, what do you do? You find a pivot, and then you can start compare two things. And if one is greater than the other one, you put it here. The other one's greater than the other one, you put it there. It's branching, right? In this case, there are no branches. It literally is, you know, take these two inputs. The main goes here, the max goes there. And, just, and it just gets written out, right? You just do these straight, the straight uh, minimax instructions. So that means that the, the, the CPU is always going to execute the exact same code to do these comparisons, no matter what the input is. And then you end up with, with the sorted output. Right? So the pseudocode for this is like this. So you have your, your original keys come in here, right? And then in the first step, you do the comparison. And then you have a bunch of minimax functions, and you write it out to some temporary output buffer. Then you do the next round of comparisons. The, this one here, three, that gets written, written out to the output. Same with the, the bottom one here. Is that correct? No, that looks like wrong. That sh there should be something else. Um, but anyway, like, these instructions are the same, no matter what the input is. And there's no branching. Right? So again, you, this is fantastic. But of course, this doesn't help us if we have, you know, that the table has four, four tuples, <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to do any of the sort merge and stuff. But again, we can use this as the building blocks to create small, uh, to the, the small runs in the beginning and then get larger and larger sizes. So if you are doing this in SIMD instructions, how many instructions do we have? For? So the question is, if you're doing this in SIMD, how many instructions do you have to do this? Next slide. OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So the first thing, again, to point out is I'm showing just single, single key values. But in actuality, this would be, again, a 64-bit join key and a 64-bit uh, pointer. Right? So you think about it, the, the, even though it's going to be a 128-bit number, when you do your comparison, you really only care about the first 64 bits because that's the join key you're, you're checking. So it doesn't matter that the, 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 the tuple pointer might be greater for, for, the, tuple, for the tuple that has a uh, smaller join key. You're never going to actually get to that comparison because you're only comparing the, you know, the first part here. 
And if two joint keys are the same, then this is just a, a tiebreaker if you use a 64-bit pointer. But again, to make it fit on PowerPoint, I'm not showing you that. All right, so his question is, how many instructions are we going to use? So first, you need four load instructions to bring this all in. But now we're going to do, uh, we're not going to sort within this uh, single register. So think of these, each of these arrays, think of that as the register. We're actually going to be sorting across the registers. Right, so think of this column here. So we're not, we're not going to sort 12, 21, 4, and 13. We're going to sort down 21, 8, 14, and 11. Right? So now to put this in our sort network, to do, to do the min and max uh, across the column, we would, we would need 10, 10 min max instructions for, for all the columns. And then we want to do the, uh, but then we need to write it out back to memory. But obviously, if, we, if we're writing contiguously what's, what's in the register, uh, then you know, this is not sorted horizontally. We want to do a, a transpose to convert it to from, from column store to a row store. So for this one, we just do a shuffle and then a store to put it, to basically pivot it and flip it, and then we can write it out. Right, so this is what? This is uh, 8 plus, plus eight, 12, 22, and then uh, 26 instructions. Versus, like, again, it, it's, it's, uh, it's 16 keys or 16 elements, uh, but you would actually way more instructions to do this in, uh, in, in a quick sort. Yes? So if we're trying to, sorry, if we're trying to sort. If we want to sort everything together, right, at the end of the day. Yes. So why don't we just sort the row and then use the same merge that we already showed? So why don't we sort, why don't we sort within the row itself? You can't do that because you can't do comparisons within, with, for elements in the same lane. Right? You have to do this, this, the, 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 the vertical operations. So. Again, this can work because the, 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 the sorting network is deterministic. There are no if clauses. It's always going to be min, max, min, max, and so forth, right? Always, and always writing up to the same location because you can't have SIMD instructions with if clauses because that the concept doesn't really make any sense. All right, so that'll get us all the, all the you know, that'll get us a bunch of runs for, for our input that are, that are within, you know, for four, four elements. Right? But then now we, gotta, we, we need to merge those together. And so this is going to be a technique called the big tonic merge network. Um, and this will be similar to the sorting network, but the, the idea here is that we're going to merge two locally sorted lists of, with four elements into a to now a globally sorted list. And it's going to work the same way as before, but now, again, we're just, we're just going to shift things around so that it produces output that are now a glo globally sorted. And we keep expanding the size of our network, and it's going to be—it's going to have the same property where it's term, deterministic. There's no if clauses. We keep expanding the size of the network until we get to that half the L, uh, last level cache uh, upper bound. So these numbers are dated. Uh, this obviously goes back to well, this is from an early paper. This is the, this is from Intel. This is 2008. This is the how to do the sorting efficiently with with SIMD, and then they used that in the 2009 paper to say how to do sort merge joining in a database. Um, all right, so they, and they claim back in the day that you can get up to two to two, 3.5x faster over a SISTI implementation. Um, I don't know what the newest numbers are today. Again, I think the, the DJB sort claims to be the fastest one. I, I don't know whether there's a, there's a, anybody's keeping track of these things. Um, so, right, so for this one, again, we're going to target L3 cache, which again is going to be, say, 100 megabytes. So we, we can, so I mean, the size of the sort of run we can go up to is up to be 50 megabytes. And then once we go beyond that, then we drop down to level three. So the idea is, looks like this. So say we want to take two sorted runs from the last, uh, from level one. So we're going to, we're going to store them in, uh, in SIMD registers, but we're going to put the, uh, the first order run is going to be in the, in the sort order, lowest to highest that it came out of, uh, the, fir the, the first phase. But in the second sort of run here, we're going to just reverse it. So it's going to be highest to lowest. And the idea here is that when we start doing our min and max comparisons here, because we know that this is, the, this is the lowest for the sort of run, and this is the highest for the sort of run, again, it's sort of a way to, again, for us to implicitly say the boundary within the values that we're looking at as we compare sort of runs, that we know there's not going to be something greater or less than, 
an element that I'm looking for. Because I know if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm in this position for this input, I know that anything above me is less than me, anything below me is greater than me, and then same thing. Right? If I'm sort of landing here and I'm comparing with this, right, I know that I, depending on if I'm in or the max, I don't need to go, there's not going to be something else that, that I missed. I may, I'm not going to have a false negative. So you, you do this min and max, you do this shuffle to move things around, and then you end up with your, your global sort of run on the output like this. Right? And again, it looks like the, 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 the sorting network, just we have these extra shuffle steps because we're, down, we're trying to deal with larger, larger, larger runs. Right? And again, the great thing about the, 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 we can do this in SIMD is that we can do all of this with SIMD instructions with AVX512. We don't need to write things back out to memory and then, or, you know, which would land in our cache and then, CPU cache and then bring it back to the registers. We can do this entirely on the, uh, on the SIMD registers. All right, so now in level three, the idea is that we're going to continue using the BitTonic ne merge networks, but now we're going to split up the, 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 the chunks that we want to sort into, uh, into subtasks. And again, eventually as we sort the pieces, we'll just, we may need to write out some intermediate data, but we'll have to st stitch it back together. So, they, so Intel is going to call this the multi-way merge sort or the, the merging operation uh, for level three. I will say that I don't know of any system that actually implements what they're going to describe here. Uh, it's interesting to, to, to think about or look at, uh, but as far as I can tell, nobody's actually doing this because I think it's, they make unrealistic expectations on the, the bookkeeping overhead of figuring out whether the, thing, the data you actually need is going to be in the CPU cache or not. And I'll describe it, me, me, what I mean in this in a second, but like, so I'm not going to go through, here's exactly the, the code that they're executing. I want to conceptually show what they're claiming that you can do. And again, you'll see as the, 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 they're, they're going to try to always operate on data that's in the CPU cache, but they're, they're going to assume you have a way to figure out, okay, the next thing I need to do, that, that task is, 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 the data that this task needs is resident in my CPU cache, so let me go ahead and execute it. But this other thing I need is in, is in the CPU cache, so let me, let me ignore that. Uh, and again, I, I think that's difficult to do because in, in the papers that describe this technique, they're testbed systems. They're not full-fledged database systems. So they assume that all the threads are just doing nothing but sorting data, which is not realistic, right? It, it, you'll be you know, parsing queries, running, if, you, if you're running transactions, you've got to deal with that. It could be background, uh, background bookkeeping, garbage collection, whatever. And so being, being have that sort of precise control, of like, OK, yeah, this thing is in my CPU cache or not, I don't, I don't think that's realistic for what, what they claim. All right, so the idea is that if, the, uh, if there's no work to be done for a given task, uh, then they'll, they'll block it in, in the task queue. And then this, the CPUs aren't going to be tied to a you know, single task queue. They could jump around and say, OK, I'll start working here. I'll start working over there. Right? All right, so, so it looks like this. So soon we have our sorted runs. And we need, to, we, we need to combine them to a larger, larger uh, to the globally sorted run. Right, so each of these uh, sorted runs can be fed into a merge task, which is then going to be now producing some, some, some output that are going to be uh, cache line size chunks of, things, of work to be done. But in this case, right, and, and it keeps going, does merge, and so forth. And eventually, we're going to have our, our final output. Right, again, we know the size of the input because we've already scanned through it and sorted everything. So we know how many stages we're going to have as we get these progressively larger uh, chunk sizes. So again, this is all computed ahead of time. So the idea here is that we have these tasks that we can put into a global task queue, but we're not going to let any worker run on this because we know that we don't have all the input that we need to then start computing the, the merge in this phase here. So say we have some, some, some workers here running this, some core, some thread, right? and it starts producing the output uh, that, that's expected. And then once this, you rec once it recognizes, okay, I've, I've, I've combined or merged all the pieces that I need to merge, then that trips the, this thing to be added to the queue as, and is now being available. So assume we have a single thread. This side can, can again jump over here. It starts doing the merge for its input. That produces some output. Uh, then it maybe jumps back over here, does this. Jumps over here, does that. And then, and then it, and it finally finishes up. Again, think of there's some global task queue that says, is the work, I, is the input data I need ready for me right now? And is it in my CPU cache? If yes, then the merge task can be run. If no, then it blocks. 
Yes. The question is, in, th in this particular example, how do I take advantage of pneuma? I'm not showing that here. We'll see that in a second. All right. So again, I, I think this is conceptually interesting. Uh, there's, again, this is, this is a high-level diagram. It's not showing like, where the pneuma boundaries are. I just think, again, as far as I know, nobody actually does this. All right. So again, this is the Intel, uh, the Intel, Intel multi-way MER sort algorithm that will be the backbone of the, or the, the, the first phase of the multi-way sort merge join that we'll cover uh, in a second. And, and that was the multi-way sort merge join that was evaluated in the paper you read about the, looking at all the different hash joins. Right? That M-way uh, you know, bar in the measurement, that was, that was using this approach. Plus without partitioning uh, or with, with the new malware partitioning, we'll, we'll get to in the, in, the, in the merge phase in a second. All right, so I want to talk about quickly sort of other alternatives to doing the Intel merge sort. Um, there's this other approach called the, the, the in-place superscalar sample sort, and this is actually what we used in our old system, noise page, and we, we, were, we were building that. Um, so this is, a, this is a generalization of quicksort uh, that was de developed in, well, sample sort was developed in the like early 1970s. It's a generalization of quicksort, which I think came out in the 50s. Um, and the idea here is that with quicksort, since it only divides, like every, every time you do a pivot, it only picks, sort of picks the you know, one pivot key and splits. The idea with sample sort is you want to divide it into, you want to look at the data and sort of try to pick, do an educated guess or better, pick multiple uh, pivot points. But in this implementation that came out, I think, also from different Germans um, in 2017, instead of copying or instead of always having an, another buffer uh, this is the same size as your input to write right into. In this one, they 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 try to try to write the data back into the, its own input, right? So you don't have that extra storage overhead. And then for this one too, it's called superscalar sample sample sort is because they have designed it to be uh, to be branchless as much as possible, right? Uh, and when you, when you do comparisons or against get these different keys, right? Similar to like the sort merge the, the sorting network that we talked about before. So this is another approach. This was claiming to be the, the fastest one in, in 20, fastest sorting algorithm in 2017. Uh, but in the last year, we had a bunch of different implementations. Uh, I'm missing stuff here. That's fine. Um, in, in, I think, June or July, or early 2022, Google came out and said, hey, we have this thing called uh, VQ sort um, written by the Swiss guy. And that's based on Google's highway library, which is their portable uh, SIMD or uh, instruction library. So in writing intrinsics, you could use uh, Google's highway library to get SIMD because it, it supports different ISAs and different uh, uh, different SIMD registers designs, so like AVX 512, AVX 2, and so forth. Right. So what's interesting about this, if you read the paper, they talk about how if if you have less than 256 keys or 64 to 256 keys, they're going to use the big tonic sort merge network that, that I talked about before. Right. And then if it's larger than that, then they're going to fall back to using a vectorized variant of a quicksort. And they claim to be you know, about 1.59x faster than uh, the, the in-place superscalar support, uh, superscalar sample sort uh, from the last slide. And then, so this came out in, in early in, in 2022. Then Intel came out with their library in, uh, in late 2022. This only supports AVX 512 on Intel CPUs for obvious reasons. Um, and so they're going to, they, you know, they want to get people using AVX 512. So I think this thing exclusively supports it, whereas this one can fall back. And I think if they choose by default, they, they prefer using AVX 2 because um, you don't worry about that, that throttle, CPU throttling issue. Right? So the Intel one exclusively uses 512, as far as I know. Right? So again, there are better versions of, uh, of Quicksort. And if I was building a system today, I would choose one of these, or even the in, the in place sample sort from the last slide, rather than building this whole contraption of these multi-level thing that Intel does. Plus, you don't have to write it yourself. And of course, the Germans, they don't do any of this. They, write, they wrote their own Radex sorting themselves, because that's what they do. And apparently, they implemented, they took the, Thomas took the Radex sorting algorithm, the quick sort that he wrote, for Umbra or Hyper, and now that's in GCC 
for doing uh, back chase or exception uh, on, on rolling. So he, he, his code, the sample from Hyper, the sorting code from Hyper is now in GCC. He's on the standards committee for C++. I, I, don't, I don't know how he has time to do this. It's insane. And that's why they make t-shirts there for him. OK. All right, so uh, all right, we got past the sorting phase. Now we're going to talk about the merge phase. Again, the idea basically is we have the sorted outer relation, sorted inner relation, and we're going to iterate through them in lockstep and compare the, the tuples that they're pointing at, the join keys. And then if there's duplicates, we may need to backtrack on the, on the inner relation. Again, assuming we're doing echo join, uh, inner join. And we just have to keep track of like, for the, the, how to jump back to the, to the, 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 the starting point and a run of, of the duplicate values. So the database system is going to be able to execute this in, in this phase entirely in parallel um, without doing any synchronization if we're going to maintain separate output buffers for every worker. Right? We talked about this when we were doing the, the partitioning step in, in the hash join. Right? You could have everyone write to a local buffer, and then at the end, you've got to have everyone combine things and put it, put it back together. Um, you can do the sort of the, the radix partitioning trick where you know, since you know the number of values that, that the that each worker is going to work on, you could allocate space and say, okay, you can write this, this, local, this global buffer here, and then you don't have to do any, any latching to protect that, those regions. Right? So we, we can be careful of how we, we design the, the output location or the output buffers for, for, the, for our workers to avoid any sort of fine-grained synchronization. And then that, that'll make the, everything run faster. So I will say also, too, like the, the, all the, the sorting algorithms that I just talked about, we can use those for, for you know, for things other than sort merge join, right? We can use it for order buys, we can use it for aggregations, and then you obviously don't do this, this, any of this merge phase stuff, right? But again, since we're trying to talk about joins, we're, we're going to do this. So I'm going to talk about three approaches. So the first two are going to come from the paper you guys are assigned reading from ETH, right? The M way, uh, the, the multi way sort merge join, and then the multi pass sort merge join. And then the, the last one here will be the massively parallel sort merge. And this, this comes from Thomas and the Hyper guys. I remember they came out in 2012, said sort merge join is faster than hash join, uh, even at, without AVX 512. And then 2013, they came out and said, we were wrong, hash join's better. So this is their approach that they, they claim was faster than hash join from, from back in the day, right? And then as the paper, again, we saw from uh, last class, uh, this, is the, this is the sort merge join that the, that the other Germans are, are going to compare against. Too many Germans. The, the other the German paper is going to pair against uh, and is going to lose to hash joins. Okay, so let's go through each of these one by one. So in the first one, the, the multi-way sort merge join, uh, this is going to be the best approach of the three, and it's basically everything that I've talked about so far, uh, where you know the cache conscious sorting up to level three, um, but then when during the merge, they're going to have each thread is only going to look at local data because you're going to partition it. Uh, into to different NUMA regions. And then as you do the merge, you're only looking at data that, that, that's in your, your NUMA region. You don't need to do any cross traffic. So the idea is here, you pay this upfront penalty, your upfront cost of writing out the data in this partitioning step. Uh, after, if, again, it's, it's the, the data is sorted, then you write the sorted partitions in different locations. Uh, but then when you do, you do the, the merge, you don't need to look, look everywhere, All right? So visually, it looks like this. So we, we first we're going to do low, local NUMA partitioning, uh, where we first have the, 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 the workers are only going to sort the data that's local to them. And then we're going to do this multi-way merge, where since we know the boundaries of the values that we sorted, that we're going to have each worker write to one other worker's NUMA region, to memory location, with all their values within, within some range. And then, again, since the, as we do this right, since they're unsorted, uh, you know, we, we, as being written, written into, because we, we didn't do any global sort here. So now, when, after they write everything to this, this NUMA region, then they do the, the multi-way level three merge uh, sorting that we talked about before. So everybody's going to do the same thing. So now, at this point here, we have uh, partition uh, we partition our, 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 our data such that each, new, each worker has local data that is, that is, that is locally sorted, but globally, we, we know this is actually globally sorted as well because we did the range partitioning as we wrote into this. Right? 
So now, on the inner relation, it's going to do the same steps as the outer relation, but just because we're in PowerPoint, I don't need space, so I'll just say sort, but it's, it's, all, it's the same thing over here. So now this point here, within each worker, it's going to have local data that is, is sorted. And, and that matches to the local data within the same boundaries on, on the inner relation. So now I, all I need to do is a local merge join within my worker, only the data that's in my partition, uh, and then again, just iterating through and comparison the tuples going across. So again, I had to do a bunch of writes here to, to put the data into different new, new regions, but now when I do the join, this is super fast because everything is local. And there's no interference, there's no synchronization across different threads. All right, the next approach is to do the multi-pass sort merge. And the idea here is that it's just like the multi-way sort merge, except that we're, we're not going to do that redistribution. Right? You're going to do the local L1, L2 sorting, like the previous, the previous way, but now we're going to go do multiple passes when, when we do our, uh, to, to do our, our, our you know, global sorting. And we do the same thing on the outer table. All right? So again, visually it looks like this. So everybody's going to sort all their local data on both sides. Then now we got to do this global merge join. So what's going to happen is every worker thread needs to look at every other, uh, every other uh, worker thread's locally sorted data on the inner side, right? So we're going to do one iterator pass on, on this data plus one iterator pass on that data, and then do the same thing for the next one, and so forth going down, right? And that's just, one, that's just one worker. We need to do this with e for everyone, right? So everyone's going to take multiple passes on all the, 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 all the data. Because again, you don't know if I'm looking at a tuple here, since, since this is not globally sorted, I've got to look everywhere. Whereas in the multi-way sort merge join, since I partitioned everything with range bound, using range partitioning, so I know that the, bound, the min and max boundaries for every chunk of data, I know that if I don't find a match when I scan my local partition, it can't, the key can't exist anywhere else. But in this approach, since I didn't do that global sort, I have to check everywhere. And so the hyper guys are going to claim that this is not big of a big deal because the harbor prefetcher is going to, is going to, is going to recognize that we're doing sequential scans on a bunch of strides of data and bring things in ahead of time so I, I, don't, pay any, uh, I don't pay the penalty for, for remote NUMA access. We didn't really talk about hardware prefetching, but we talked about software prefetching where you, 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 you can pass instructions and say, I think I'm, I'm going to need this, this, this chunk of data and some, some range of memory, and the CPU will try to bring it into your CPU cache, right? Explicitly. It doesn't, it's not guaranteed to do it, but it's, like a, it's, a, it's a helpful hint. With hardware prefetching, this is transparent to you as, as the database, in the database system. This is just saying, oh, I recognize you're, you're, you're just ripping through some region of memory. And therefore, I know that you're very likely to continue keep reading sequential, sequential data. So therefore, let me go ahead and prefetch the thing that I, I think you're going to need next. The OS does, this, does the same kind of stuff too for, for reading files from disk. Right? Everybody's trying to prefetch to avoid long, avoid long stalls because hardware is slow. Right? Because CPU cache is going to be you know, order of magnitude faster than, than going to DRAM. And, you know, and then double that if you're going to a remote region. So the idea is to use the prefetcher to hide all this. But again, in practice, it doesn't work out. All right, so this is going to be the hyper approach, and they're going to do something that's much different than the two other ones that I showed. So the first thing they're going to do is range partition on the outer table and then redistribute it to all the cores. Um, and then they're going to sort the outer relation so that you have a globally sorted, uh, the, 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 the outer table is globally sorted. Um, but you're not going to do the same thing for the inner table, right? So in the other two approaches, I, the inner table will do the same thing as the outer table. Uh, in this one, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, the, you, you're just going to do a local sort within each partition in, in the inner table. And the idea here is that now when I do, uh, when the outer table starts iterating over the inner table in each partition, it knows the minimax boundaries that it's looking for, and therefore it doesn't have to iterate, do a complete scan over, over the entire table. Right? Once it knows that the thing I'm looking for cannot exceed this point in the inner table, I stop. Right? So it looks like this. So again, we do our cross uh, numeric partitioning like before, where, where we end up with a like, globally sorted data uh, for, for, for the outer table. 
and then now uh, again globally sorted, and then now for the the inner relation, I don't do I don't redistribute. I just sort locally. And again, I can, I can do any of the sort of algorithms that I, that I talked about before. So now when I want to do my, uh, my merge join, again, I'm going to iterate through every tuple in the outer table. But maybe I only need to iterate over a portion of what's in the inner table. Right? And once I see the thing that, I, that, once I see a value that exceeds the range that I'm looking at in the outer table with, on the inner table, then I, I'm, then I stop my scan. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this for all of them. Of course, you have to do this for, for, for everybody. They're all doing the same thing at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So again, the, this seems like a bad idea, right? This seems to contradict what I said before, that we want to minimize the, the, the amount of non-local memory access. But again, they're going to claim that in this paper that because all your access, your, all your reads are sequential, that the Harvard prefetcher can mask all this, mask the latency, right? So in their other papers, they talk about these sort of rules for parallelization, which I think are kind of interesting we're discussing. I would say also, too, that these are, uh, you know, these are valid, I think, also for, for hash join as well, not just for the surplus join, you know, obviously, except for the, the, the sequential reads. Um, so the, the first thing they're going to claim is that you want to have no rights to, no random rights to non-local memory, right? You want to do all the rights. If you had a right to non-local non -local memory, you want to do sequential rights, because you just sort of bash those up and write them out all, all at once, all right? For the rule number two is that when you have to, uh, when you have to read uh, non-local data, you want to only do sequential access, again, because the Harvard prefetcher is going to be trying to hide those, those memory stalls, because it, it'll, it'll figure out that you're, you know, you're, gonna, you're reading things in, that are contiguous. And of course, a solid rule for any, any algorithm is that you never want to have any worker or core wait for another. So that means that they want to avoid the fine-grained latching or synchronization barriers of like, can two people trying to write to the same memory location and you, and you have to protect it with a latch. So if you can pre-allocate the regions that the different workers are going to write to uh, for your output buffers or the intermediate results, then you, you avoid all that synchronization. And we saw that with the radix partitioning stuff before. Right? You compute the prefix sum and then you know the offset that everyone is allowed to write, to, write into. So, I'm going to discuss the numbers from the ETH paper. And again, this paper is 10 years old. The hardware at the time is pretty beefy, although 512 gigs of RAM for a single node is still pretty good. Uh, the Swiss, they have money. Um, but I'm not so much care about the absolute numbers. It's more the comparisons of the different, uh, of the different algorithms um, and understanding why one might be better than another. And as I said, the spoiler is going to be is the multi-way search. The multi-way sort merge join is going to be, uh, is going to be preferable to either the, the second approach or the or the hyper one. And then I'm going to compare against a rate of partitioning hash join. Uh, and again, as I said before, like sometimes you'll see in the literature they say, oh, we're doing a radix join uh, it, it, without saying it's a, you know, a radix partitioned hash join. Right? All right, so the first graph here, they're, they're comparing the three different approaches. And then what I like is that they broke down the, 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 the runtime of the different algorithms based on whether it's doing the partitioning, the sorting, uh, the, the sorting of the merge phase or the join of the, of the merge phase. Um, and then again, what, what you see is that the, the multi-way one is just faster if you're measuring the, the number of cycles it takes to produce one output tuple. Right? The hyper one is, is not even close here. Uh, and then if you, want to if you want to measure in terms of like the throughput, where higher is better, you, know, you can see it clearly again that the, in terms of like how many tuples can I process as I'm executing things, the, uh, the multi-way multi -way one is just faster, right? And it seems counterintuitive, right? Because you're, it's like the hash join stuff. It seems like you'd be slower because you're spending more work to do this redistribution and do a bunch of random writes to write, to, to write out the data to different partitions. But because now when I do the, the merge operation, do the comparison between the outer and the inner table, because things are all local, uh, that makes me run faster. Right, like you sort of get things lined up the way, the way they should be, in such a way that like it's it's the ideal way for how the CPU wants a way to run instructions and read data. So in terms of scaling up, again, this this hardware is, is pretty old. Uh, just in the very beginning, you see, you see that if you don't have a lot of threads, there isn't that big of a difference. But as you scale up, the multi-way one is 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 superior to the hyper one. 
So again, the, the extra instruction you're, you're, you're spending for the multiple you join um, end, ends up paying off. In terms of absolute numbers, it looks like this. Uh, let's skip this. This is just looking at different, different sizes of, of the join tables. Um, but you know, again, you can see that in most cases, the hash join is always, always superior. I guess it's not even the best hash join. This is, this is the radix hash join. Right? And then in terms of, as you scale up the number of tuples, again, the radix hash join is, is when it's a small number, smaller table size, it does much better, but then eventually converges. And again, I think the overhead, he, overhead here is just, you're spending so much time partitioning, uh, and that's why the two, the, the two approaches converge. So this is the graph that I showed before, obviously without all that, those optimized uh, results, because again, I said nobody actually implements them. So again, this is the, the in the, the paper read last class, this is their implementation of the multi-way sort merge join, the first one that, that I talked about here. Um, but if you're doing no partitioning on a linear probing hash table, uh, you're going to you know, you're going to get much much better performance than this, right? And again, you can see why it might be misleading to think, oh, sort merge join would be better than hash join. If you say, oh, if I want to use hash join, I should be using rate of partitioning because it seems like it would make sense. And the literature claims is that, at least prior to this, that, that this was superior. But simple is better. And it'll, it'll run much faster here. OK? So that's, that's sort of a, a quick crash course on and everything you need to know about sort merge join uh, and sorting in, in modern systems. And again, the main takeaway is going to be that the hash join is always going to be a superior choice. There are some systems that don't implement even the sort merge join, but only implement the hash join. Again, the, the, the Germans' new Umbra system only does, only does uh, hash join. I looked at this before, the, before this, this lecture. As far as I can tell, most of the enterprise systems will do sort merge join as well, as well as hash join. And it's up to the optimizer's job to figure out which one it should pick. Sometimes, it'll call, sometimes they'll call it a merge join, um, but the basic idea is, is the same thing. Now, we didn't consider the case where, again, if there's an order by clause in your, uh, if there's an order by clause in your, in, your, uh, in your query, or you're doing an aggregation right after the join, and therefore you can rely on the sort ordering to do your aggregation more quickly, versus, well, if, if the group by is based on the, the join key, then you can, you, can, you can merge the aggregation inside of the join, or reuse the same hash table, but that's not always the case. Um, but there may be the case where, again, if you need the data to be sorted a certain way up above in the query plan, then maybe you actually do want to do the sort merge join because you need to rely on the fact that the data has actually been pre-sorted for you. Right? You pay the cost of sorting it, but you can reuse the sort sorted data uh, multiple times. So we're going to see sort merge joins are variations of, of a join algorithm that relies on sorted data uh, next class because that's when we'll talk about the multi-way, uh, the worst case optimal joins. right? If you haven't looked at those papers yet, the, the big assumption that they make is that in order to do that comparison across multiple uh, tables at the same time, you need to have your, your input data be sorted. So it's going to look a lot like the sort merge join algorithm. It's just the data structure they're going to use to do the probes and comparisons across more than two tables is going to be slightly more sophisticated. Right? Instead of just, you know, a single iterator going, you know, just doing the straight comparison across two tables. OK? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite all pattern. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes! It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come! Willie D, that's me. Rolling with fifth one, South Park and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a four. Six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say fifth makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>